I have a very great privilege to introduce you to our speaker this afternoon, um, who is the manager of Kenfig Nature Reserve. Please welcome Mr. David Carrington. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I'll start um, by introducing myself and uh, how I got involved in nature conservation and everything. So if you go back to when I was an eight-year-old, my, my parents had noticed that I was very keen on nature and wildlife and things. And uh, there was a local club called the Bromley Young Ornithologists Club. Um, I grew up in south-east London, that, that's Bromley, um, Kent. And uh, they joined me into this club, and I've really never looked back since then. Um, I grew up with people um, studying birds and things, and uh, went through school, did, did, did my degree in ecology in um, northeast London, uh, what's now East London University. Um, then I was uh, lucky enough to uh, get a job working in London, and I was building um, nature gardens with a, with a project in, in and around where the Cutty Sark is now. Or the, in those days, it was the proper Cutty Sark, and now it's the, the rebuild. But we went round to old bombs, bomb sites in London and built, um, made them into sort of nature gardens with ponds and trees and, and, and things for wildlife. And uh, I worked, worked there in East London for a while, but really, although I, I grew up in London, I was really, at every opportunity, wanted to get away from the hustle and bustle and out into the countryside. So I was always cycling out into the, uh, into the green belt and uh, going bird watching and, and, and the like. And uh, so I was looking to get out of, out of that job and managed to get a job as a countryside ranger working in Northamptonshire and uh, it was a, a lovely site called Daventry Country Park on an old canal feeding reservoir. So when the canals were very busy during late summer, the reservoir would be used to sort of keep the, the uh, canal full of water. And it was a lovely place, um, good bird watching, nice old meadows and things around the, around the margins. And uh, it was a very, very, very nice job. And I uh, spent seven years in, th in that site. But uh, my wife and myself, we, we always said we didn't really want to stay in the Midlands and uh, we'd like to uh, get, get out uh, somewhere more coastal. And so I'd been on the lookout for jobs and uh, noticed in uh, New Scientist this place called Kenfig. And uh, I thought, well, I don't really know a lot about the coast and sand dune sites, but I'll give it a try. And you know, we put together a good application. I was lucky enough to get get uh, get the interview, and uh, they called me back for a second interview, and I was fortunate enough to uh, get the job. And uh, so I moved here, moved to Wales in 1996, and have been here ever since. And I have to say, I, I just absolutely love Kenfig, Porthcawl, South Wales. You know, it's just, it's just so happy living here. And um, um, so, so that's, that's my background. And uh, I'll talk about my um, first sort of career love, if you like, which is, which is Kenfig. Now, this, this talk is um, ad adapted from what I do for A-level students looking into um, the sort of the geography and the physical geography side of uh, sand dunes, but uh, I'll talk about um, some of the special wildlife as well. Okay, so let's, uh, let's, this is new to me, this technology, so we'll see how it goes. All right, so that's us. And what's important in the formation of the um, sand dunes at Kenfig, it's one of the features, is this huge reach so we've got the North Atlantic, and the prevailing wind comes up from the Caribbean and goes that way. So we have very strong winds. <laughs> uh, the other second important thing to form the sand dunes here is this funnel shape here. Now, we have, I think it's the second highest tidal range in the world. Uh, it's absolutely immense. 
And that's caused by this, uh, this funnel shape here, so the tide forced right up, as you know, we'll know the seven bore and everything. Now that tidal range is important because it exposes a lot of sand when the tide's out. So that's obviously our, our coast. The third important thing is um, just where we're positioned compared to the last period of glaciation. And the edge of the ice sheets, you know, it's a very long period of time, but roughly were sort of, you know, this sort of area. And the water flowing down through the, um, the underneath the ice, carrying all the um, moraine and uh, washing it out into what was then a river valley, which is now Bristol Channel. Um, it put vast amounts of sediments into the uh, what's, what's now the Bristol Channel, absolutely huge amounts. So we've got the perfect ingredients for what uh, is termed a hind shore dune system. This is where the sand grains have been driven in by wind action, sort of inland from the shore. So this is a, a photo that uh, someone took from an aeroplane and, uh, and, oops, and donated to the reserve. So there we have the, uh, the beach, Skir Point, the mussel beds are under the water there somewhere. And uh, we've got the, the, um, the prevailing wind blowing in, in on land. We've got all the sediments there. We've got the vast tidal range. So you've got the perfect ingredients for creating a hindshore dune system and the sand extends a long way in. It goes up to Kenfig Pool. Um, if it, com it comes up, that's the Kenfig Pool caravan site. The visitor center is just there somewhere off, off shot. But, but the sand, its places, goes about uh, you know, almost two miles inland. So it's a vast, vast sand field. You know, it's, it's a big, big dune system. Um, now, the other oddity about Kenfig, which does make it uh, almost unique um, in Europe, is it's incredibly wet. It really is. Uh, you'd think a sand dune's not been able to hold water. It rains, the water just percolates down through the sand very quickly and down into the bedrock and away. And that's pretty much what happens at Merthyr Mawr on the other side of Porthcawl. But uh, Kenfig, if I can go back... Um, underneath the sand is a lot of um, clay and sort of riverine deposits, and there's a lot of clay in that. And uh, when the water it rains, it hits the sand, percolates down through the sand, and it hits that clay layer, and the water just can't go anywhere. It just um, sits there. So when there's a lot of uh, per, um, precipitation and not so much evaporation, then up that water table comes. And uh, typically in the winter, you know, we'll get surface flooding. And uh, something like 30% of the site can be underwater in a wet winter. But just to give an idea, this is just on the west side of the lake. I took this uh, not so long ago in February. And it's still flooding. And it, this is the driest winter. I mean, so I've been there 20 years, and this is uh, by far the driest winter. But we still had surface flooding in places. But if we go back to uh, 2014, that was... Uh, uh, the other end of the extreme, it was a pretty wet winter, and uh, this slack um, along the, the southern bridleway, people, um, some of the um, enthusiasts actually swam that, uh, some of the open water swimmers that we seem to have quite a few of in Porthcawl actually swam, swam along there. So, um, so although it's uh, sandy, we got, and we've got the tip, more typical sand dune species in the habitat, we've also got a tremendous amount of these very wet um, it's all seasonally flooded wet areas. Now, in Wales, we could be forgiven for sort of thinking sand dunes are fairly ordinary because we are blessed with a tremendous number. So, um, 56 dune systems uh, in Wales is, is quite a lot and quite a big area. And pretty much all of them are, or a lot of them are, um, regarded as uh, sort of top top importance for nature conservation, so the 31 are sites of special scientific interest. 
Um, nine are sort of higher up in the uh, league of importance than our national nature reserves. And six, including Ken Fig, are right at the top of the tree, like being in the premiership. They're special areas of conservation. So they, uh, the special areas of conservation, or SACs, are where the, uh, the nation states in Europe have just said um, these sites are, and habitats are so important that we're just stamping our foot and we will not take further losses. They cannot be built on. They have, um, their protection is entrenched in, um, sort of in the law, so uh, they're protected. So Kenfig is, as, and, and Merthyr Mawr, um, are sort of as important for nature conservation as it gets in the UK. But uh, what might surprise you is the most important part of the dune system, the part that has the, the most, um, the most, sorry, I forgot to set my stopwatch, um, the most importance for a lot of the rare plants and uh, specialist creatures are what looks relatively barren to the, to the naked eye. It's areas where there's quite a lot of bare sand and plants are just colonizing. The specialist species are just coming in and uh, starting to grow. So on this one, you've got marum grass, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, and uh, various other specialists. And uh, those bits are the bits that uh, are really important to us. And uh, in the past, those, uh, that early successional uh, habitat and bare sand was, wasn't a problem. There were lots and lots of it, and pro probably uh, most people would have said there's too much, certainly locally, I think it was quite a concern. And uh, you've got these vast areas of uh, bare sand, and it must have been on days like yesterday, it must have been pretty horrific, so sand would have been uh, um, sweeping through the site. So that was, um, I think that was a German aircraft, uh, Luftwaffe, sort of time, or just after there. It was just a lot of aerial surveys around that time. Hang on. And then um, if you jump forward um, to 2009, and uh, it's just striking. It, where, where's all the sand? It's all, uh, the dune system just fallen asleep. It's all cloaked in a thick layer of vegetation. And uh, you know, given what I just said about the importance of the, um, the early successional stages, that's, that's a concern for me as a sand dune manager and ecologist. You know, and a lot of my talk is going to be talk going um, into more detail of what we do to try and uh, maintain or get back some of that bare sand. Now, some people, when we've, you know, we've taken various measures, some people say, but no, Kenfig never used to be like that. You know, we, we, there was never lots of bare sand. And, and things that's uh, we're going back too far, but actually, it wasn't that that long ago. And if you look back to um, 19, we've got these wonderful photos that uh, um, a local resident saw for sale on eBay um, and uh, passed on to uh, let, let, let me use them for talks and things. And there's some lovely shots of Ken figure what it looked like, because you can re recognise the uh, the Magdalen Church there. And it really was um, very exposed. These are the... Marum is the normal dune-forming plant, but it, uh, there's another species, um, Salix repens or creeping willow, and it forms these very tiny little hedgehog dunes, lovely shaped things. And we see them today, and you think, well, how on earth were they formed? And, we, and uh, it's only, you know, when you look at old pictures like this, you realise what, what was happening. Um, the flooding, also I've had recently people saying it's something that Bridge End Council are doing when they're managing this place. Why, why is all this flooding? It's uh, never happened in the past. But actually, yes, it did. You, know, you can see plenty of winter flooding there. Uh, it's just a normal, natural uh, thing of Kenfig. Now, in the modern era, there's very... most. The problems we've got at Kenfig seem to be replicated across Wales and the Welsh dune systems and, and in um, northern Europe. Um, but there is one site that's bucked the trend, which is uh, Morvedufferin in West Wales. And here they've got uh, this huge dune that's uh, slowly but surely ploughing its way inland um, through, through the site. Everything is going that way 
and everything on its uh, on the slip face here just gets buried. And it's, this is like the holy grail for sand dune managers. If only we c I could get some, one of these going at Kenfig, because uh, it create it just rejuvenates the site. It brings back all the um, the initial habitats, and just uh, it's just absolutely wonderful. Um, this is looking from the other side of that, and it's showing the formation of a very important uh, habitat feature. As the uh, sand grains blow away that way, um, it only needs about 11 miles an hour to spit, pick up a dry sand grain and start it um, moving downwind. Um, but uh, once it, so, that, so the wind will erode the sand and it will just get lower and lower and lower in these big sand bowls. But eventually it's the water table and that's what's happened here. And it's that uh, sort of a damp patch. And the wind could be 111 miles an hour. It, it wouldn't move, move it once, the, once it's got to wet sand. It would just stick there. So it makes these very strange flat areas. Um, this is only a small one. We've got much bigger ones at Kenfig called a dune slack. And uh, they're a very special habitat with all sorts of rare plants and uh, animals. Unu unusual because it's seasonally flooded, as I think the next one will show. There, so in the winter time, they're, they're usually flooded. Um, there's very few nutrients because it's just grown on, you know, developed on sand. Um, but there's quite a lot of calcium, so it's calcium rich, and that's from seashell fragments mixed in with the sand grains. And uh, the, the plant communities that develop there are not found anywhere else. And uh, th there's all sorts of wonderful plants. I, I wish. Uh, I could take you to Kenfig today to show you how wonderful these dune slacks look. You know, they're just full of orchids and all, all manner of lovely, colourful and rare plants and insects. Now, I've all talked about this already, but uh, the worrying statistic is um, that the decline in Welsh dune systems of uh, the bare sand. And it really is... Uh, uh, rather concerning, and you think, uh, where are we going to be in 50 years' time with them, with the, with the dune resource? So less than 2% of the, the Welsh dune resource is actually bare sand now. And what would I like if I, had, if I could just um, have uh, all my dreams come true for sand dune management? What would I like? About 10% of the site to be bare sand. So um, plenty of erosion going on, and uh, about 30% of it to be those early pioneer habitats. So what are we doing to try and achieve that? Well, we've got various approaches. This is what's been going on for a long time, since uh, it was first made a nature reserve. There would be groups going out with uh, small, smaller tools, and it still goes on today, and it's, we've still got a place for it. Um, that, that was taken uh, last autumn, I think. And um, groups of volunteers coming out and strimming and raking and uh, trying to uh, create bare, more open habitats. But on a site of this, uh, this scale, I mean, it's 1,300 acres, Ken Fig, it's not going to be feasible to continue managing it or get, do what we need. Uh, so uh, we've got some uh, uh, larger, more powerful equipment. And this is uh, our old faithful tractor at Kenfig. Uh, that picture is the blades that are in there, and they're very heavy duty, tough um, hammer flails, and uh, really good for, um, uh, basically, I see that as a, a giant rabbit or sheep or something like that. It's doing that, that same job. It's chopping up the vegetation, and um, you know, opening up the habitat. This is, incidentally, a good example of one of these uh, natural features. It's a dune slack that, uh, where the wind had eroded it down, down to the water table, and it's remarkably flat. And it's why golf courses are made often on um, sand dune sites, because that's a ready-made fairway, if you like, and uh, all they've got to do is control the flooding um, put in drainage, and you know, the, the golf course is there, so that's why the, there's Lynx courses all over the place. It's a very cheap way to make a good golf course, but, but that flatness is all perfectly natural. 
Um, I showed you the heavy duty mower. This is a different device. This um, flicks all the cuttings and picks them up and puts them into the hopper, and then I, I pile them up on the edge. So it's trying to keep the, um, the dune slack habitat as near to that sort of very short turf and not much of a soil with the more specialist plants. As the soil enriches and, and, and they get older and older, um, you tend to lose the, the, the richness of plants. You tend to have less species and they're, they're, uh, um, a lot of the orchids die out. But uh, even the tractor on this sort of terrain, although it's quite effective, and I can do that was myself, uh, that was a day's work. But you know, I can't mow everything, and uh, plant succession continues at a pace. So then there's the um, well, I'd say it's my preferred option, the most sustainable one long term, which is grazing of some sort, and uh, sheep grazing is uh, pretty effective in a way. Um, I like ship, sheep grazing as long as it's in the winter time. I don't like summer sheep grazing at all. And the reason for that is that sheep are quite selective and they'll walk across um, an air, a piece of grassland and they'll look for the flowers and bite those off. And they'll do that first and then they'll, if you're lucky, they might eat some of the grass. So a few sheep can quite quickly remove all the flowers from, from, a, from a meadow or from an area. So uh, yeah, they're not, they're not well liked in uh, conservation circles. And uh, I meet some entomologists um, quite regularly uh, visiting Ken Fig, and they, they've got a term for these, which is woolly maggots. They just don't like sheep at all. Now, rabbits are absolutely ace on dunes. They're, they're fantastic. They maintain a very, very short sward, and uh, so that allows um, a lot of, uh, lot for a lot of species diversity. They um, scrape and scratch, if you can show in the next picture. So they create nice bits of bare ground, and uh, that's uh, good for new plants to uh, colonize. And uh, they're free, and they provide food for other wildlife. And uh, it's just good all round. The, 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 the only problem I've got is uh, I can't manage the numbers. I can't get the numbers as high as they, they were in the past. And uh, they have good years, but uh, on the whole, the, the population is just very low. And uh, I think part of the problem is that here in South Wales, with these, all these wonderful habitats and uh, green wild areas, there's also lots of predators. And uh, it does seem to keep the population in check. And uh, much to my frustration, we've tried a lot of different things over the years. We've done um, um, actually digging the holes for them um, with, um, uh, to try and help them colonize. And it works to a certain extent. But it does seem, you know, they peter out if we don't uh, um, sort of really manicure the areas where we want them to be, rather than them take over the management. Um, but uh, if you talk to the golf course owner, if you ever get them to come and give a talk, and I'm sure they'll do really good talks, they will tell you about the horrendous problems that they got with rabbits and that they can't get the numbers down. <laughs> if only we could get the golf course rabbits to uh, move over to our side. Um, so cattle are our preferred management option, and uh, they are extremely good. They're not selective, so they won't walk around looking for a flower. They might eat some by accident, but they generally don't look that closely at what they're eating. They just uh, wander around so and, and, and eating whatever's sort of in front of them. So they're less damaging to the, um, to the flowers, so you do get more species diversity. Um, the, the dung is also more valuable for um, various uh, dung-eating um, beetles and things. And uh, they're able to t take down thicker, rougher vegetation as well. And uh, these, uh, the highland cows with the long, long horns, well, they're all highlands on that, I think, apart from the bull there, um, are absolutely brilliant from my point of view uh, for uh, managing the site. Um, they don't need much 
input. Uh, they, they, they don't need so much um, veterinary care as, as the more modern breeds. They survive in the winter uh, when there's not so much, you know, it's not so easy to find food. They're pretty clever and their metabolism and things seems to be able to cope. And, uh, yeah, they're good. But uh, the farmer who uh, we've got uh, grazing, um, he's got the grazing rights on, on the site. He's not so keen on them. Um, although he did buy them, he thought they were going to be good and ideal on Kenfig. But he, he isn't so keen. And he, he um, likes to say, his favourite phrase these days is that the rare breeds are rare for a reason, which is that they're rubbish. And that's why they're rare, because if they were any good, then there'd be people be farming them everywhere. And uh, he, he's not so keen on them because they're quite small, and the, so the young don't fetch as much money for him at market. And at Kenfig, they go feral too quickly. They forget that they're domesticated, and when it comes to rounding them up, they don't behave like his normal domesticated cattle do. So um, he, he thinks he's got them all into one herd and, uh, puts, and starts driving them back towards his farm. And then they'll make a dash for a bit of uh, scrub. And then three will just sit down and hide in the bracken and rambles. Two will sort of double back. Some will go one way, some will go the other. They don't, they just don't, they're just too difficult for him. And he has to spend a lot more time um, looking after them. Although, interestingly, he did say when um, um, he was asked what is his favourite beef, what would he choose to eat? He said, oh, he'd always go for Highland cattle. So uh, he thinks it's the nicest tasting. But So he has, um, he's experimenting at the moment with these and he's phasing out the Highlands. So as they die, he doesn't replace them and he's putting these in, which are the uh, Red Ruby Devons, which are still quite a rare breed, they're still very tough, they're quite happy in the winter, they don't need much supplementary feeding and they do a pretty good job so it looks like these are days are numbered and we're not going to see them so long but we'll have plenty of these about. But one, once we get to April, I'm not sure I've got a picture of the modern breeds, I don't think I have, once we get to April, he, he, the 20 or so of these that we have out in the winter are increased to about 50 cattle and uh, they, they're his sort of um, Formula One racing car, sort of level modern breeds that produce wonderful big calves and make him a lot of money, but need a lot more input. So he, he doesn't put them on in the winter because they'd lose weight too much. Um, so there's a mixture of the old breeds and the modern, modern beef cattle out at the moment. And they look fearsome with those horns, but uh, they're really gentle, very docile animals, the highlands. If, it, uh, if things were different, if we could somehow subsidise it, then we'd remove everything other than these. I think they, these are just wonderful. And uh, uh, I think that's just summarising what I've just said. I mean, that group of cattle there, where we'd been doing some scrub clearance, taking down some birch trees, and uh, these learnt very quickly that the buds in March did actually have some nutrients in them, so they were just walking around picking all the buds off the, uh, the felled birch trees. Um, but even with the grazing, we're still struggling to get that target of um, getting up to anywhere near 10% bare sand, and you think, well, you know, we'd have to almost have to be starving the animals to uh, try and get um, that level of uh, sand, bare sand. So we took the extreme choice back in the um, um, near around 2000 to actually bring some heavy machinery onto the reserve, which totally, you know, goes totally against the grain, really, for, for someone who's been in nature, involved in nature conservation all his life, uh, all his working life. But uh, you know, we, we're desperate to get, to get this, this bare sand that uh, floods in the winter time. So um, we have uh, the uh, tracked excavator and then the, uh, the trailer there to remove all those turfs. And uh, pretty much since then, it's, uh, we've been able to find grant aid through one route or another to uh, continue. Um, just trying to re restart the process, really, but this is what the wind would have done in the past. And uh, we'd have had um, bare habitat like this, and um, the 
plants to colonize, and obviously the plants don't know, they don't care whether it was the wind blown created or machine created. So we've been doing this with, the, with a certain degree of success. Yeah, we're pretty happy with, uh, with most of these, um, these areas that we've uh, done where we've scraped the turf off. And uh, we've also gone a step further and gone for rejuvenation on the coast. And this is the wind speed at the coast, where the winds come off the Atlantic and first hits the land. That's where the wind speeds are highest. And wind is everything with the uh, sand movement. So by um, cutting these uh, notches, it's a bulldozer here helping with the work, cutting these notches out, the wind speed here is very high. And the hope is that it would start one of those giant dunes like at uh, Morford Dufferin and sort of start pushing the uh, sand in land like happened so, so, so re regularly in the past. And uh, yesterday you would think it, it's working perfectly but we don't seem to quite have the winds um, uh, that were in the past. So they do seem to peter out once you get in, in land um, 50 metres or so. Having said that, compared to when I moved to Kenfig, um, you know, these areas of sand dunes are um, you know, quite, quite impressive to see. This is uh, filming uh, Coast and Country uh, for, the, for a short TV programme about, uh, about what the work we're doing here. Now, I showed you those pictures before where it was all green. Now this is just, you can see some of the, um, the difference now. So this is last year's photo. And this is the not some of the notches that have been cut with the sand driving inland. Um, and also some of the scrapes on the, the, on the dune slacks where we try to start the process uh, in the slacks again. So we're not far, I don't know if you can judge. I've never I ought to work this out sometime. Is that 10%? Not really, but it's, we're getting there. Better than it has been for a, for a long time. Now, it's very, we met, we had a seminar of all the uh, sand dune managers in Britain, um, going back about five years ago now, to try and say, well, what are we going to do? Because we can see what's happening on all these sites. We can see we're going to lose uh, a lot of the um, important species and things. And I um, managed to get uh, a speaker from Holland, and I've uh, used some of his, a couple of his slides here from his talk. And Holland uh, is well ahead of us in their sand dune management for nature conservation. Um, it's partly because uh, most of their sand dunes seem to be owned by the water extraction companies, so they're really, really rich, and they have whole ecological departments, and they seem to be able to invest a lot more money. And um, this site, uh, the advice, this is a good example, the advice they gave us was if you're going to do this sort of project, you've got to go as big as you possibly can. And that is huge. I don't I dread to think how much that cost. This is, that's a car park. So they really, they said, if you, if you just do small little hollows and things, they won't work nearly as well as if you go for a very large scale thing. And all this area, this is all sand that's blown inland as a result of that work. And sometimes the wind must go the other way, because it's got little fingers of sand going the other way. And now this, uh, I had to put this in, it just uh, goes against everything I learned as a child and, and what I thought with Holland. Um, here, they actually breached the dune, dunes to let the sea come in. And that's some very excited um, sand dune, uh, Dutch sand dune ecologists looking at their site, watching the tide uh, sweeping in. Now, I thought that would bury the whole country, but uh, apparently not. Apparently that was uh, what is perfectly natural, what happened in the sand dunes in the past. You'd get big storm events, wa water would surge in and um, cause a lot of erosion. Um, and then things would settle down again, a new dune would form across, the, uh, across here. But um, again, it's a, it's a part of this, uh, um, uh, what I call like a dynamic uh, equilibrium so that one bit gets eroded, but other bits are getting overgrown, and it's a, but overall, everything um, stays the same. So it's sort of dynamic, but it's equal. And this is where we got the advice about uh, 
if you can, do your rejuvenation work right on the coast because that's where the wind speeds are highest and their site there, you know, it's pushed in a long way. But again, the cost, you know, it's a bit beyond, you know, all of these Dutch things are way beyond what we've had for grant aid that would have covered. Right, I now want to talk about uh, some of the wildlife and some of the interesting species. Now this, I have to start with fen orchid because if uh, you talk to any uh, botanist um, and say uh, what's special about Kenfig, they would say it's the fen orchid, this, this plant. This is as pretty as they get. Um, they're not like uh, most of our 16 orchid species that we get at Kenfig. They're not pink or brightly coloured. They're just yellowy green flowered. They're only about this tall. But uh, it's a plant that's absolutely requires that dynamic equilibrium. They need the new dune slacks to be uh, um, developing. They really, really hard to manage. And you can see site after site has lost them. And uh, that is because of stabilization. What, what, what they need to do, they, they're very good. They've got dust-like seeds and they colonize quite early on in, after that bare sand stage. And uh, they're very good at when the, when the first vegetation starting to uh, emerge. And they can number in tens of thousands in quite a small area, probably the size of this room. And uh, they are become the sort of the dominant orchid and uh, everything is good for them. But as soon as the soil starts developing over a period of time and other plants start coming in, they start getting shaded out and uh, they go into a, a period of decline. And eventually they, they'll disappear. And uh, hopefully though in that time, another slack has um, started, you know, uh, been eroded and then they'll colonize that. So it's a hard one, you know, with traditional countryside management and techniques of thinking, put a fence around it, it's a special little bit, don't touch it. It just doesn't work for this, this species. It needs uh, active, uh, a lot more active uh, management. Um, there are, there's, two spe there's one species, but two varieties, and the June variety has got very rounded leaves and they're much smaller. It's called a fen orchid. And uh, because the nominate race grows in fens, and that's the Norfolk fens there, uh, the sites there, where the, if you were looking for them, you'd be sort of doing this through the vegetation. You know, it's like you know this high to try and find the plants, and uh, they grow quite a bit taller and um, quite different. While well, our the Welsh uh, populations, and one brief for a while they were at Bronze and Burrows there in North Devon. But uh, these um, um, are a distinct race, and Kenfig is the only um, sort of proper population. They're, they went extinct at Whitford, which uh, was, um, in my time since been in Wales, there was a population there that went extinct. And uh, there's a couple of plants were seen last year after a seed pod was taken from Kenfig and uh, opened on suitable habitat there. So we're all crossing our fingers that that's the beginning of a sort of repopulation of, uh, of Whitford. Right, I'm going to skip through this because I don't think time's going to allow, but uh, there's a lot of uh, in, uh, research and work gone into uh, fen orchids. Um, at the end of this month, I'll be doing this with a team of uh, botanists and uh, keen volunteers searching and monitoring where the fen orchids are. And they are a real hands and knees job, very difficult to, uh, to count. And like uh, Karen there from Natural Resources Wales, she's got a cane. Uh, Alex there, she's got a cane in her hand. We go through like that, put canes down where the each plants are, and then Karen will come back and she's got this uh, 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 electronic device called uh, a Trimble Global Positioning System. And uh, it's like a little computer, and it bounces, it gets the signals off satellites, and uh, will locate down to a centimeter where each plant is. So she'll go back, plug that into a computer, and then produce a map with dots on it and show where every plant plant was. And uh, 
as, like I said, they're a nightmare to manage because uh, you think everything's going well and there could be lots of flowers. But then uh, when you go back in the autumn, like this is an October photo, um, you find most of those plants have disappeared. What happened to the wide, wide, and uh, you know, not that many of them actually get to set seed. So this is uh, very precious because three seed pods each would have about 2,000 seeds in. So the potential there for repopulating um, is quite high. But, uh, you know, grazing, trampling, bad weather, slugs, whatever, um, snails, they'll all um, nibble off. And uh, so you don't get as many as you'd hope. That's a seed pod, and that's the uh, just starting to split and crack open, which happens really late in the season. It makes it difficult again for me to manage because if I go in with that tractor equipment before these have uh, matured and the, the seeds have come, come out, then I could end up collecting all the pods and putting them, rotting them down in a compost heap somewhere, which would be no good. So that was fen orchid uh, finished. Uh, the, the most important of our plants. This is a second. Oh, this is the second most important one. This is called petalwort, and it's a tiny liverwort. It's like that big. It's like uh, we dwarfed by a rabbit dropping. And uh, that's an example of someone uh, doing a survey uh, for us last autumn, which was to try and refine it, because it's been fairly widespread at Kenfig, but uh, hasn't been recorded for several years now. So we uh, paid uh, this chap to spend uh, two weeks out on the dunes doing a survey. He wasn't just looking for petal worts, he was looking at other things, but uh, most of them are tiny little obscure things, and it's hard to find someone that can actually, uh, with the skill set that can do this, but uh, Barry is the man, uh, 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 ecologist that works in Swan from Swansea. Uh, this is another wonderful dis sort of rediscovery. This had been extinct for 50 years, and uh, it was sort of known to be at Skir Point, on the uh, short coastal turf there, and, uh, but it disappeared. But uh, the farmer there, Tony, um, going back, have I got a date on that? Yeah, it was a bit before, there was a couple of years before that. The farmer, um, Tony, decided he wanted to go back to what his father had done, and he stopped sheep grazing at all on, on the, uh, the coastal uh, dunes there, and went back to um, the Welsh black cattle, and uh, that year, um, several of the uh, field gentians came back, and they, they, they flower every year now. So it would appear that they perhaps have been there all along, but the sheep have just nibbled the flowers off. So it's a, um, luckily, they, they, uh, they hadn't got extinct. There was uh, enough seed bank there and uh, um, plants just hanging on. And uh, for any bird watchers, I'm sure you'll all know this one. This is what... Um, Lots of visiting people come, uh, birdwatchers come to see. We have um, reed fringe around the edge of Kenfig Pool, and uh, this is the best bird for exploiting that habitat. This is a bittern, and uh, they mainly hunt fish, but really pretty much anything that moves that they can fit in their beak, they'll, they'll take. They're not that fussy. And um, they're there pretty much from October through till March. But uh, don't expect to just be able to walk up to Ken Fig, sit down and hide and see one. You, know, it's a, you do need to put a lot of time in. They're very secretive. Even though they're big, you know, they stand about that high. They're extremely difficult to see. And uh, they don't breed at Ken Fig, don't breed anywhere in South Wales. But we are hoping that's going to change because not that far away in uh, Somerset, in Somerset levels, um, there have been some... Um, a lot of work to improve the wetlands there. And there's a strong population of breeding bitterns. So it just seems inevitable that they're going to come across the Bristol Channel at some point and start uh, booming and hopefully breeding uh, somewhere, maybe not Kenfig, but uh, somewhere in uh, South Wales. Um, there's another one that's tricky to see at Kenfig, but uh, they're, they're, they're out there. Not, not as a breeding bird, but uh, in the winter time we get uh, short-eared owls hunting. They're, of all the owls, the one that you're most likely to see in the daytime. And uh, 
this was um, early afternoon. We were doing a patrol in the um, in the Land Rover, and uh, this owl just flew next to the vehicle and landed on the post right next to us. We were so lucky. So we've got a lovely picture of that. Uh, this is one that uh, used to be very rare. It took me, I think I came in 96, it must have taken me 15 years being at Kenfig until uh, I saw one. But now, these are annual. This is a great white egret. In fact, there was one uh, at Kenfig last week. And this particular bird spent uh, the summer at Kenfig. And it was really tame. It was commoner than, uh, tamer than the grey herons. You could see it very, very close to the hide. Um, this is our most important bumblebee, called the shrill carderbee. Um, carderbees um, have got that name because they, to make their nest, they scrape the hairs off plants. And uh, the shrill carderbee has a slightly shriller buzz. <laughs> and uh, you, you can, um, with practice, you actually can... Uh, learn that and you actually know the shrill carder bees there before you've seen it quite often. Now these have had a really depressingly rapid decline. So uh, the, a survey in 1979 had them as fairly, not common, but widespread throughout the British Isles. And um, now there's, they're known from hardly any sites in Britain, uh, you know, five or six sites. And they're very hard now to find at Kenfig. I've not seen one for two years, actually, on the reserve. Although they do quite like the Brownfield site, the, um, the dis disused railway um, just to the north of the site, and the, the field there. So they're still doing OK there, but it's quite not doing so well at Kenfig. They need, they need, the difficulty for this type of bee is they need a large landscape with flowers continuously from... When they first come out in May time, the queens emerge right the way through into October. There can't be a gap. There can't be a period where um, there are no plants. So as one flower finishes, another species needs to be coming into flower. And uh, you know, a hay meadow, a traditional hay meadow, would be brilliant. But then in July, they're, they're, they're harvested, and then there's no flowers, so any colonies would die out. So. Uh, even though that's on a common plant there, red clover, you know, they're, they're, they're frustrating, a bit like the fen orchid, very frustrating uh, to uh, try and manage and help. And I, I do fear we're, we're losing them from the reserve. This has got to be our most, uh, Britain's most uh, attractive moth. And used to be fairly common, as a garden tiger suggests that. But again, this is a species that's on, had some uh, huge decline declines in Britain and very hard to find in anyone's garden now. We still get them occasionally uh, on the reserve though. Um, I don't, that, this isn't particularly rare, but it's uh, just sort of a wonderful insect to show you. It's a ruby tail, one of the ruby tail wasps. And uh, I don't know what species. I'd have had to catch it and kill it to identify it down to species, so I wasn't inclined to do that. Its, um, it's life's, life uh, strategy is quite uh, nasty, though. It lays its eggs in the, um, the, the holes of uh, other solitary, of solitary bees. And uh, the, uh, when they hatch, the larvae will go in and uh, predate the, uh, the bees, the solitary bees. And the, the, the bees know it, and they'll come and try and kill it. But this, this is all... Um, the exoskeleton is extra hardened. It's like uh, extra armoured so that the stings from the uh, solitary bees can't affect them. It's incredibly beautiful. So it's, about, it's about that big, a tiny. It's just outside my office. Um, this has got to be my favourite beetle. This is a, a mimic. This is uh, the bee beetle. And uh, it's... Uh, affords some sort of protection for itself by pretending to be a bee. <laughs> a wonderful one. Yeah, they'll be out. This is the best time of year now to see those. Uh, and this is our rarest amphibian. This is uh, the great crested newt. 
And we've got uh, an artist to do these sort of 3D type pictures on the wall of some of our iconic species. And then uh, I was clearing out a drain that was just, uh, just in front of the building, just down here. And lo and behold, there was a great crested newt there, just a few meters away from the, uh, from the painting. And uh, it's one of our, um, you know, being on the coast and um, in good quality habitat means that we do pick up quite a lot of rarities and interesting migrants and things, not just birds, but uh, insects as well. And this is probably one of the best uh, insects we've had as a migrant. This is a death's head hawk moth. It's a sort of like a skull-like and skull -like pattern there. That was in uh, November, a couple of years ago. It actually squeaked. If you touched it, it does this sort of quivering with its wings and uh, uh, makes a squeaking noise, a bit like a mouse to try and, I don't know, put off predators or something. And uh, I'll just put this in just to say the people that lived at Kenfig uh, originally in, in, in the, uh, the township, uh, which is on the north of the site, would if they could hear me talking today, they would not uh, believe I could be saying these things about wanting more bare sand and wanting more erosion. Because uh, in medieval times, in what, what was known as the, um, the mini ice age, when uh, there was like 200 years of very harsh, cold winters, those winters when the Thames froze over, that, that sort of time period, um, the, uh, the village was, there was so much sand mo moving inland that the original township was buried and had to be abandoned. And the, uh, the time team came and did an excavation back in 2011. In three days they did all this. And that's the sort of depth of sand that uh, was above them. So it's sort of unthinkable then, but uh, apparently, according to that Dutch ecologist I was m talking about, uh, it's four times easier to stop a dune than it is to start one. You know what I mean? This, this process of, er of getting the erosion going is, is uh, more, four times more difficult it is than to stabilize them. And that's uh, Tony and, and Phil uh, during that filming. Apparently, the, the producer said that this, the time team, uh, the, the thing they did here at Kenfig was in their top 10 of the, the sites that they've done, that in their sort of how, how well it went and, and, and things. They, they had a really good time, even though it was August and it was just like drizzly rain and cold the whole time. But they really liked it. They, they called it uh, the Welsh, Welsh Pompeii. Because the, they just couldn't believe. They went normally when you go dig down into an archaeological site, um, everything's been lots of things have been stolen over the over the hundreds and thousands of years or whatever, and uh, it's all a bit a bit of a mishmash. But here it was just like they got took the sand off and oh, it's all pristine, you know, lovely uh, lovely work stones and everything, and it's all all still there. It, they had to cover it all up at the end. That's a condition of the filming. It all has to be put back to, to, to how it was before. And that's it. That's my talk. <laughs> okay. So. Um, I don't know if I've gone over time a bit, but I'm uh, welcome to uh, answer any questions. Um, <coughs> erosion. Uh, it strikes me that the whole road across the front there is being gradually eroded by quite an alarming rate over the last couple of decades. Uh, uh, is there any concern about that in public access to, once that whole road is gone, it'll be impossible to walk uh, along the front there? Yeah, to the, we had a stormy winter, didn't we? Was that three... Three years ago, the, mm. one with the winter where the cod ended up on the golf course. Do you remember that? Yeah. And the, it, yeah, one more night, we would have lost part of that track, wouldn't we? It yeah. was, we lost yeah. in one part. We lost about 11 meters of uh, yeah. of our coast of, of the, of the yes. beach. Uh, yeah, I don't think there's anything we can do about it. I think we have so to accept it. Um, uh, it uh, it uh, may uh, happen. And global warming predictions would mm. suggest the sea level is going to rise, and we're going to have more volatility. 
And yeah, we might, because it is handy to me, although it's not natural, it's a man-made yeah. feature that was put in to make, take the stones from Connelly down to the um, breakwater at Port Talbot. But uh, uh, I, I, yeah, I think it will happen. I don't think it's going to be, you know, if you look to that example in Holland where they had opened up the front, I think, yes, we might have a storm event push through, uh, the, the, the pea, if, if the storm's at its worst, right at the top of a big tide. Um, but then, you know, that might not then again be repeated for another f a few more years. So mm. we'd expect it to, to cover over again. Mm. But yeah, we might lose that nice path. I don't know, yeah, because be the, the Welsh coastal path would be uh, yeah. affected, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, before I ask the question, when I think of Ken Fink, of course, I think of Steve Moon, uh, who was very instrumental in the early years in getting Ken Fink off the ground, really, I felt. Mm. Um, is there a problem with C. Buckthorn at Ken Fink as there is at Merthyr Uh There is a problem um, with invasive you know, non-natural species generally, it's not, it's not just sea buckthorn. Um, we don't have the problem as, as seriously as uh, Merthyr Mauer, um, but we do. It's part of my annual work program is to, uh, to um, cut and treat uh, you know, sea buckthorn. I'd, I'd, I'd like to say we could get rid of it, but uh, it's, a, it's a tenacious little uh, bush that just keeps uh, popping up. But it's not, na it's not natural at all um, in the west coast of Britain, just on the east coast. And it was planted, you know, because it's very good at stabilising uh, bare, bare sand. And one other, what is the source of water in Canfig Pool? Um, well, it's mainly rainfall, uh, but underneath the clay layer, it's limestone. And uh, almost certainly some water from that limestone um, gets up through and into the pool. And uh, we can say that because when we have, um, very rarely these days, but when we have a very cold winter, there's always a bit of the pool is uh, unfrozen because groundwater, uh, the temperature of water in bedrock is always around 10 degrees, summer or winter, it's very constant. So that upwelling, that warmer water would keep, always keeps a bit of the lake uh, open. So it's mainly rainfall always, and uh, with a little bit of uh, groundwater input. That's what, what makes, I mean I haven't talked about the pool that much, but that's what makes Kenfig Pool in itself such an important um, wildlife habitat is that it's just not polluted. It's wonderful. It not, it's just rainfall and groundwater. There's no streams bringing um, pollutants from roads and ditches and um, you know herbicides and, uh, and uh, you know nutrients off uh, farmland or any of that like most lowland lakes have. So it's really pristine, beautifully clear, all manner of wonderful rare pond plants and insects and things. And last last place. Uh, um, to hold a medicinal leech um, in the sort of mainland. I think Hensol Forest lost its. And then the next nearest to be on the, the Isle of Anglesey. Uh, I did read some uh, reports not long ago on the internet that there was, used to be seven springs underneath the pool feeding it, but now that's gone down over the years. And another research I read back in the 50s, he done it. Some gentleman was convinced it was being fed by these underground springs, and he put um, harmless dye in one of the lakes up at the Beacons, and it eventually turned up at Kenfig Pool. Yeah. So have we heard that story? Yeah, I, I think it's entirely possible. Because yeah. limestone is a bit odd. It's, do you think you know, that the speed that water can flow through chalk and uh, limestone would be very slow, which it would, except um, as it goes through, it, um, it uh, dissolves. 
and you end up with these um, like underground conduits, like underground rivers, and the water can travel very fast over long, long, long distances. You know, we all know about caves in uh, chalk, chalky uh, places. So it could easily water could travel from Brecon Beacons to 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 Kentfig in quite a short space of time. Uh, the other story I heard, I've never completely confirmed it, is that when Tama Quarry wanted to go down another 50 feet, they're down now about 270, 280 feet, they were turned down on the grounds that they would then be below the groundwater level of Kenfig Pool, and there was a fear of filtering back and causing a, you know, a level of the pool to be affected. Yeah. Have you heard that story? Oh, yeah, yeah, we, we're very familiar with this. The, the danger is that one of these limestone conduits, pipes, or natural pipes, or whatever, could be between the quarry and the quarry could be between, you know, to, could, yeah. could alter that. So they dig down, obviously, they have pumps to dewater the quarry so they can work in there, but it could then send the water off in a different direction. And uh, because of the uh, wonderful protection that uh, special areas of conservation have, they, they can't just um, do that without uh, due regard to the implications it could have on, on, on Kenfig. So it, it is influenced by that. I suspect it won't... I think, I think in, in all reality, because of the um, importance to the economy of the uh, quarrying in that area, it will probably they, they will be able to deepen, but uh, there'll be um, close monitoring, and we're involved with that already with uh, monitoring the water table heights at Kenfig. You know, every month I take dip well measurements, and there were Natural Resources Wales um, two men from there today checking um, the data from some deep boreholes that go right down through the sand, through the clay, um, right down into the bedrock. So it's all been monitored. For that reason, you know, that we're worried about what, what could happen if the quarries do uh, um, cause a problem. What are the special circumstances? Yeah. What are the special circumstances that make a national nature reserve or a SAC as opposed to a nature reserve? Um, there's a whole list and ranking of habitats and species and uh, national nature reserves. I think there's more of a human side of value to people, while the SACs are more the uh, scientific. Um, yeah, uh, they're just a whole, whole category, a whole list of categories that um, you sort of tick the boxes and it, it would make it to, enough to rank as a, as a SAC. Uh, and if you don't get quite as many, then it becomes an, uh, it's a national nature reserve. And then it's... I don't know, it's triple SI and local nature reserves. So what do you have to do on site to maintain its status? Um, oh, sorry. I should have <laughs> muted it. <laughs> um, mowing, scrub control, invasive species control, um, policing to prevent um, removal of things, prevent trying to stop people putting things in that they shouldn't. People, you know, we've had terrapins introduced into the lake, and um, people trying to stop people stop garden plants. You know, we get fly tipping, and uh, we have to try and deal with that before nasty uh, invasive garden plants start to uh, like. Spanish bluebells and things start yeah. <laughs> colonising onto the, on the site. Uh, lastly, if people want to get involved at the site, where can they find information? Is it on BCBC's website or do you have your own? There is, there is some on that. Um, I've so where, where would you look on the BCBC website to find information about Kenvig? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure off the top of my head. I mean, if you looked up, I mean, if you just did a search on Kenfig Nature Reserve, Kenfig National Nature Reserve on uh, Google or whatever search engine you want, it'd bring up a whole load of things and it would include the council one. Um, I set up a blog spot one. There's a Facebook page. I think there's a couple of Facebook pages. There's one I do and there's one that uh, a local uh, um, uh, individual does. 
Uh, so there's quite a lot on the internet to, to find out. And uh, of course, if anyone wants to help help me at the nature reserve, just get hold of me, ring me up at the reserve, or call in and call in and see me. And uh, we um, today went. This is why um, I've pushed tonight. Today's meeting a bit later because today is a volunteer day at Kenfig every Wednesday and every Monday. So uh, yeah, we always need help doing. Uh, it's always outside, really out outdoor jobs. I mean, today it was just um, we split. So half of them did the butterfly transect uh, survey, and the other half helped me in the car park, just strimming, putting in a new sign. There's always it's always odds and ends to do. So yeah, if anyone's got spare time on a Wednesday, just or a Monday, just give me a call. Thank you. Okay. Another question over here. Uh, you mentioned that um, Kenfig was uh, inundated. Can you? When was that exactly? The uh, the village. Yeah. It was sort of medieval times. Yeah. When? Oh, I don't know. Off the top, straight <laughs> off the top of my head. Medieval. What does that mean to us? I and mean, we're all getting that way ourselves. But there we are. Thank okay. you. But before 1350. Were, were the dunes uh, well developed and just shifted in the? Uh, Sorry, I can't, I'm not coming through very well. Were the strong winds, were, were the still sand dunes which were shifted by strong winds? Or um, were they uh, it reinforced by the, the beach being blown up and then the whole lot moved inland? I think it might have been a combination, because I think a certain historic records say um, overgrazing was an issue, that uh, the, the people uh, on the common living there couldn't agree between them to, um, sensible level of grazing and uh, they just uh, it was just like a free-for-all and everyone did too much but I, I suspect I mean I think the most likely thing is just wind speeds were higher in those days it was just a very volatile period and uh, uh, you know wind is just so important such a fundamental thing and I think that's why all the Welsh dune systems are stabilizing at the moment is uh, um, winds aren't aren't the same as they used to be. You know, it's just we're in that period of climate at the moment. I mean, this the sand extraction, of course, um, which is, uh, would stop some of the sand perhaps reaching the beach and getting blown inland. And there may have been like offshore sandbars at that time that just by chance coincided with the strong winds, and that caused a lot of input of sand. And at the moment, we've got like. Uh, a whole, whole raft of things, say there was a sand extraction that had been going on just offshore. Um, you've got global warming, so there's more time for plants to grow, uh, you know, a longer growing season. Um, there's uh, myxomatosis that knocked out rabbits. Um, there's the, you know, it's hard, it's hard work and not much money in grazing on sand dunes, so a drop in grazing levels. Um, we've got atmospheric deposition of nitrogen from traffic, from industry and things, which causes more rapid plant growth. So there's a whole load of things now that are causing dunes to stabilise. And, you know, back in 1300, who knows quite what all the other factors were, but it seemed like that, that, at that time, I think there were things that were more, fun, more um, suitable for sands to be blowing around and sand dunes sort of building up. Can I try this one? Yes. <coughs> David, o over the years, our walking group has had a lot of fun going over the dunes and looking particularly at the orchids. Uh, and in so doing, we've seen the, the, uh, the popular orchids, the, the marsh orchids, the, uh, the southern orchids, the pyramid orchids. But I always um, remember, and uh, we're always very conscious that Jewel in the Crown is the fen orchid. Mm. And I always remember coming back at the end of one walk and seeing a, a, a man very dishevelled, panicking, had come all the way, he said, from Norfolk, and he was desperate to find the fen orchid. Now, is there something which is intrinsically uh, special about an orchid which appears to be a threat to extinction? Or is there something in it? Is there something here? What, what is it that is special about the fen orchid that does attract people from all around the country to desperately find it uh, here in the Kenfig Dunes? Yeah. Uh, well... It's a human thing, isn't it? I don't. There's no real reason why people would say they want to see all the orchids. 
as a, as, a, as a pose, I want to see all the speedwell species or I want to see all the grass species in Britain, but orchids seem to attract, for whatever reason, you know, they're, they're big and they're colourful, I, I don't know, but they're, the orchids do have a lot, of, um, a lot of interest, a lot of orchid enthusiasts, and they want to be able to tick off and see all the British orchids. You know, they bought an orchid book, and there's one, one on that book that they haven't ticked off yet. This is the only place you're going to get the... I think of the bee orchid as well, that the bee orchid is. Is that, is that under threat? Because you know, we find Not really, it, no. Uh, it's that's quite, all right, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Whereas the fen orchid, yeah. uh, hopefully you can lead us to uh, some, find some again yeah. this year. Yeah, cannot, can, fen or, bee orchids will grow in disturbed... Poor, poor, again, you want low soil levels, but they'll grow in old quarries and things. You know, we've got the best place at Kenfig's a car park. Uh, so yeah, they're not so they're not so difficult. Uh, but uh, yeah, so the, the June fen orchids, well, and the Norfolk, the ones in the Norfolk Broads, are, you know, they're, they're, there's, they're more numerous now than Kenfig, but uh, they're very hard there to manage for as well. Only just starting to discover how to uh, get the management uh, right there. So yeah, they're just uh, yeah are tricky, and they're not in the same place each year. They just seem to. It seems as everything seems to kill them. If I just look at them, you think, oh, that's it. I want to see that one again. <laughs> and then they pop up somewhere else. And, yeah. Are there any more questions? Uh, David, when yes. I was a boy about 10 years of age, I used to go down, way down the down, downs, yeah. down past the river, and there was an area there, it was about three quarters of a mile long by about a quarter wide, completely bare sand, locally known as the desert. In yes. fact, uh, when they filmed on a bit of a budget, scenes from Lawrence of Arabia, one of the horse racing scenes was done there, and I was wondering, is there any of that desert left? It's, it's all gone green now. Yeah, when I started in 96, yeah, there was still quite sandy, but yeah, that, that desert, so-called desert area, yeah, that big sand field is... Uh, been colonised. Had you heard about the film aspect? No, I didn't know that. Lawrence of Arabia filmed there. You slept up. If you were a local and you knew of it, when you, when you watched the film, there was one tiny bit of a second on where the carbide works come into it. And, you know, if you knew of it, you knew where to look. But to most, they wouldn't have known where it was. Well, I have to watch that again now. <laughs> Just a quick question, if I may. Um, question of snakes. You haven't mentioned, I don't think, anything about snakes. I remember playing golf Royal Porth Call on a few occasions, seeing the odd adder knocking about. So I su suspect that there is such a population out there. Um, yeah, I didn't put snakes in because uh, the memory of my, my late father, who had such a phobia, he would have hated, he would have been enjoying the talk and then absolutely gone cold if I'd put a picture of a snake up. Um, grass snakes doing f okay at Kenfig. Um, slow worms, which are of course a lizard, legless lizard, not a snake. Adders, I've not seen one in 20 years. Um, most people that come to me and say I've just seen a, an adder I say, oh, really? That's interesting. They're really rare here. What, what did it look like? And then they describe a grass snake. So I'm a bit sceptical about quite a lot of the records. But uh, there have been, let's think, that we had um, one that was about that big, dead, on the top of the beach about four years ago. It was photographed. But that may have washed in. You know, where it was seemed a bit strange, but a very young one. Um, then there was a juvenile that was photographed by someone. He, I was sceptical. He said, oh, I've got a picture. And he showed me this uh, picture of a, a young adder that he's described as north of the pool. But uh, again, a lot of visitors don't quite get the orientation right. So that, that's the, another record. And then 10 years ago, ago or so, in one October, we had three dogs bitten and go become ill and uh, two of them were taken to the vets and proved positive for adavenim. So it does appear that there may have been one or some around that time, but uh, extremely, if you see an adder at Kenfig, you're either very lucky or unlucky, depending on your <laughs> <laughs> perspective. Are there any more questions? Been a very interesting talk and I uh, hope you I expect most of you feel more inspired to go do a bit more walking <laughs>
<laughs> I'll pass the, the mic over to Jeff to give a vote of thanks. Yes, it was part of a false start, though. David, yeah, thank you for a very um, informative and interesting presentation. I, I think probably that uh, a number of us, and I'm certainly one, um, are not aware or we're not fully aware of what we have on our doorstep, to be quite honest. And we should, we should sort of visit it more often or pay attention to it, to be quite honest. I'm surprised by a couple of things, actually, because uh, I must admit you mentioned about um, sort of opening up sand areas, having clear sand areas. Um, that would surprise me, I, and I've got to make you mention my rabbits as well. Um, as, as, as a golfer, um, I must admit, uh, sand is, is, is not one of my favourite uh, <laughs> items, and, and I always thought it was the best use in concrete, actually, but perhaps I'll change my mind on, on that particular one. The one thing, in, just to mention, in, in Pulling Kenfig, the rabbits, because of problems on the golf course, they have created a bit of a sort of habitat mm. outside it. Only thing is, rabbits don't sort of read signs very well, and they're sort of still on the golf course. But, but I, I got to admit, the dedication that uh, that you and your team and all the volunteers put in is 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 very impressive and, and necessary. And, and I must admit, I, I hope you've enjoyed the the last 21 years here, and I hope you have many more years continuing such such good work. Yeah, and I you. wish you all the best for the future. And and thank you again for thank for you. a good presentation today. Would everyone please thank you all for your time. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And uh, really very lucky to have uh, so many wonderful committed volunteers. Thank you.